Thank you. Hey, family. It is so good to be with you um, and to be able to worship and serve God together. I love you like family. Bring you greetings from Washington, D.C. And I love your leadership. I love Pastor Seth and Hannah. They're amazing, beautiful family. So want to get right into it? Can we do that? All right. If you will follow along, I'm going to begin reading from Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 23. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. Holy Spirit, I thank you so much for where you are at work in us, in the church, in the world. Help us to respond to you. Amen. This is a moment in the life of Simon Peter, a devoted follower of Jesus, That is very hard to hear. Have you ever found yourself hearing God's heart, hearing his voice, either directly or through someone else, and you are willing to acknowledge that's pretty hard to hear? This is one of those moments. It's very hard to hear. My wife, Marianne, and I will celebrate 29 years of marriage this November. Yeah. We are in love We love going on walks together, talks together. We bike together. Um, And over the course of 29 years, um, we still just have a freshness in our marriage. Having said that, there have been many moments of intense fellowship where she has told me the truth about myself. (laughs) And she has said things that for me have been rather hard to hear. Any married couples want to just kind of weigh in with me and say, know what you're talking about. Um, in those moments, they are mostly unpleasant, often painful, rarely ever good, especially at first. But after nearly three decades, I recognize that what's hard to hear, later on, if I listen to the truth of what's being spoken, it's actually good to hear because what is produced. This is one of those moments for Peter. What God is saying to him is very hard to hear, but later on, it's good to hear because it's not only about Simon Peter, it's about the church, it's about us, it's about responding to what's in God's heart that may not yet be in our heart. And when I consider 2020 and all that has unfolded, particularly as I think specifically about the racial injustice that has boiled to the surface in our nation, there are things that are being said that are hard to hear. And there are many voices speaking, social media, all kinds of platforms, so hard to hear. But what's most important is that we hear and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's happening here. Simon Peter finds himself in a moment that's very hard to hear. And let's give context. Jesus had said to his disciples, including Simon Peter, go and make disciples of all nations, all the ethnic people of the world. That was a command. It was the great 
commission, not the great suggestion. But for all of Acts chapter 1 through 7, they weren't reaching the nations. They were reaching the Jews living in Jerusalem. So for the first seven chapters of Acts, only Jews were being discipled. You come to Acts chapter 8, and there's great pain because of persecution. Uh, uh, Stephen is martyred for his faith in Christ. And there's an outbreak against the church. And literally, the church is scattered throughout regions that they never would have ever found themselves. You have Philip, who goes down to Samaria. And Samaritans were, were looked down upon by the Jews. Eventually, you have the same Philip who's catching up to an Ethiopian from Africa. It's amazing how the gospel began to spread, but it was as a result of great pain before there was progress. And I think we find ourselves in our nation in great pain, but I'm believing that there will be great progress as a result. Why would this be hard for Peter? I mean, it's so hard that he said something that we as believers should never say. When he says, Peter, get up, kill and eat. He says, no, Lord. When is it ever acceptable to put no in front of Lord? <laughs> no, Lord, I've never, ever eaten anything that our Jewish laws say we ought not eat. For Jews, there's a particular diet that was established. We see it in the Old Testament that certain foods were not allowed. And so this sheet that was lowered in a vision, the vision didn't come up. It didn't come up. It came down. So it's from the Lord. It had all kinds of four-footed animals, reptiles, uh, birds. And Peter's looking at this and kind of going, where's the fish? He was, he was waiting for the meal to be prepared and he fell into a trance. And in this semi-awake, semi-sleep state, God takes advantage of the moment and begins to lower animals that represent people that he had never associated with. In fact, there were Jewish laws that said Jews and Gentiles never get together. On top of that, we need to take to note that the Jewish people are no strangers to oppression. Whether you go all the way back to the time of Egypt where they were oppressed by Pharaoh until Moses, God sent him to bring deliverance, all the way up now to Roman oppression under Pharaoh. They were believing that God was going to send one who would deliver them from Roman rule, from being oppressed, and he realized this is what he was expecting, that the kingdom of God would be established and would overthrow Rome. But how many realize that our view of God is obviously oftentimes off than what God has in mind. And so in this moment, Simon Peter's saying no for a couple of reasons. And I want you to see something. So first of all, go back to that moment where you first began to follow Jesus. Do you remember that? Yes. So here's Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Simon Peter heard... <clears throat> Heard, heard this. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. This was a miraculous catch of fish. And Jesus says, you've been, you, you, you know what it is to fish. I've stepped into your context, but now you're going to be fishing for men, fishing for people. I don't believe that these two Jewish brothers speaking to Jesus, who's this Jewish rabbi, have in mind what he has in mind. He wants them to fish for people. They're thinking Jews only. He's thinking all the ethnic peoples of the earth. When you say yes to Jesus, your yes is an all in, but you don't know what all in means at first. It becomes clear as you walk along. And there are moments where Jesus says things to you that are an absolute violation to your expectation. And that's why he finds himself saying, no, Lord. On top of that, he's being invited to go visit a Roman centurion. Roman centurions were soldiers who had a command of 100 soldiers, and they were loyal to Rome. And he didn't want to have anything to do with them because they were oppressing them. Uh, John the Baptist had spoken to uh, the Roman military a group of people who asked him questions. He said, listen. Be content with your wages. Stop using your force to take money from people. And so Peter had witnessed what it looked like to see Roman soldiers abuse his Jewish fellow men. And here's God saying, I want you to go see Cornelius, this Roman centurion. In fact, Jesus had one time even said, he said these words. There was a Roman soldier, a centurion whose servant was ill. And in that moment, he wanted Jesus to heal his servant. He said these words, I'm a man of authority. 
and you're under authority. If you just speak the word, my servant will be well. And Jesus stopped the crowd and said, I have not seen faith like this anywhere in the nation of Israel among the Jews. But in this Gentile Roman soldier, there's faith. And he said, I tell you the truth, there will be men and women from the east and the west, outside of the Jews, Gentiles, who will come and eat at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Jewish mind would have thought, Gentiles are going to have a meal with us? So this whole idea of having a meal with Cornelius wasn't a new thing. Jesus had spoken into this, and he had declared all foods clean earlier when he said, it's not what goes into a man's mouth that makes him unclean. What goes into the mouth passes out the body. That's the end of it. But it's what comes out of a heart that makes you unclean. When, when, when greed comes out of your heart, when, when, when sin that's in the heart, adultery in the heart, uh, prejudice, racism, all that which comes out of us, that's what defiles us, not what goes into us. So all these things were at work on him. Jesus had said, love your enemies. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. So all these things are at work. Simon Peter, I get his no. You want me to love my enemy? You want me to eat food I've never eaten? I've never had barbecue spare ribs. I've never had fried chicken. That's not kosher. My wife and I in February with great friends traveled to Israel. And on the flight, there were so many wonderful Jewish people. And every meal that was served, they only ate kosher food that was prepared for them. While the rest of us who were on the flight ate what's common to most of us in this room. So to this day, this is something that's practiced. So it was it was. Something that was challenging him, this vision. Let me explain what I mean by that. There was a time in my life when Jesus was asking me, just an impression, Donnell, what do you want? And I'd always list off what I want. Um, not, and, and it wasn't I want the source. It was here's what I want from the source. Here's the needs I want you to meet. And one day Jesus said, what do you want from me? And I paused because in that moment I recognized, wait a minute. I want you. That's the beautiful thing when he asks, what do you want? And your response is you. I want you and I want what you want. And what I recognize, it's easy for us to sometimes in our walk with Christ to say we want you and we want what you want. But when he says something that's a violation of our expectation, that's when we realize what we really want is our version of you and our version of what we think you want. And when those two come into conflict, It's hard to hear, but it is good to hear if you embrace it. Amen. So here's what happens. Holy Spirit tells him, I want you to go downstairs and I want you to go with them and do it without hesitation. The Holy Spirit was at work in Simon Peter and the same Holy Spirit was at work in Cornelius, this Gentile, to bring Jews and Gentiles together. I want you to understand something. A multi-ethnic people living together in unity is one of the greatest demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. It's an absolute miracle. It never happens on accident. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to Simon Peter, this Jew, the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to Cornelius, this Roman soldier, to get them in the same room together. And not in the same room, but to actually experience unity in the presence of God. The vision that's being lowered is one of heaven where God says uh, through his servant John, I looked in heaven and I saw every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every language worshiping Jesus at the center. That's what God's heart is. And America doesn't look like that. But our vision has to be set not on what America looks like, but on the vision that's being lowered to us from heaven. And Peter struggled with it at first, but I'm glad he went down. And they stopped at the gate. Why do you think they stopped at the gate? I'll tell you. Here's my thought. There's a law that says Jews and Gentiles don't interact with one another. So they never went into each other's home. So when they arrived in Joppa, the place where Simon was staying, literally they stopped at the gate because unlike me, if you came to my house, you would just walk through the gate, ring the bell, Donnell, you're home. But they know they're Gentiles, and so they feel we may not be welcome. We're obeying the Holy Spirit. We've been sent, but we're not sure how they're going to respond. And he probably would not have come down the steps and, and, re- and responded as graciously as he did, except that the Holy Spirit had been working with him through that vision. And so you find them on opposite sides of the gate, sort of like this series, divided, standing at the gate. And while standing at the gate, the Holy Spirit has them and he says, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? 
and they begin to unfold the work of what the Holy Spirit has been doing in the lives of them individually and then now bringing them together. And it's why I love this moment because what's going on in our nation in America, even though I hear what's happening in the media, even though I see what's happening in all the places, I'm trying to listen to the voice and find out where the Holy Spirit's at work bringing us together. So no matter what's happening in the culture at large, the church within the culture is responding to the Holy Spirit. Say amen or oh my. And so while they're standing at the gate, he invites them in. They spend the night and the next day they go to Cornelius' house. And Simon says, now I know that God does not make any unjust distinction between people based on their ethnic heritage. And you won't know until you go. So it's an amazing moment. I shift now because it's not Simon Peter and it's not the servant, Gentile servant sent by Cornelius, but it's we in America that are standing at a gate. And the gate that we're standing at, this racial divide is ancient. If you go back to the days of emancipation, I thank God for the progress that has happened in our nation. I thank God that though my great-great-grandmother was a slave, I was born free. So we've made progress. But in the days of slavery, some things I say may be hard to hear, but I hope you understand it's good to hear because of what it can produce. During the days of slavery in the church, which was predominantly white, there was a debate about what to do with slaves. But it's an unusual debate. The debate between white leadership in the local church was, should we preach the gospel to, to slaves or should we not pre preach the gospel to them? And this debate raged around the issue of, if you preach the gospel to them, they'll realize that freedom is in Christ and they'll want to be free. The other side, no, if you preach the gospel, they'll understand gentleness and they'll remain docile. And I go, tilt, wrong question. The question isn't should you evangelize them or not, it's should you keep them as slaves or not? Hello? Do you realize if a slave was baptized, you had to take a note that this baptism is for my soul, not my body. I, I am still pledging to remain a slave. You say, that's the past. I know. But because the church was complicit and not listening to the voice of God at the gate in that moment. It took civil war, a bloody war, to bring about what God could have done without a war. Fast forward, civil rights movement. We now have Jim Crow laws. The house in which I live, we're the first African American to live in this home because of covenants that said you couldn't sell this to black people. House was built in 1928. We love it. But there was a time when I couldn't move in it because of the color of my skin. Uh, I think about the fact that racism is sin. Sin is a disease of the heart, and America has heart disease. She was born with it, and she's not well. It has spread throughout her entire body. It's in her arms, her legs, her feet, everywhere. It's in her political system, her criminal justice system, her educational system. It's everywhere. Even in the educational system, 1954, uh, you have landmark legislation that desegregates uh, public schools, Brown versus Board of Education. That was in 1954. Nine years later, Dr. King, civil rights movement saying, here's why we can't wait. Because slavery, we were emancipated 100 years ago. 1954, we're saying desegregate. And here we are nine years after that landmark decision in which the Supreme Court said, with all deliberate speed, desegregate. And only 9% of the South, with respect to African Americans, was desegregated. To make it a little more current, in 1975, I was growing up in the inner city of Washington, D.C., and my mom had always emphasized education, and there was a white school she wanted me to go to that was across town. So she wrote the superintendent and said, hey, I want my boys to go there. And they said, no, you can't. Well, long story short, we used the false address of a friend who was a white woman that was in that neighborhood, and we got in. And the principal welcomed us to the school. We sat in our office. I'm 10 years old. My brother's seven. My mom sat between us. And she said, looking at their grades, they're straight-A students, but they're coming from an inner-city school. Their grades will drop, and you won't stay here. You're going to have to go back where you came from, i.e., we don't want you here. And one day I was in class, and my brother comes in crying, and I have to step out. And the principal's there, and I said, what's wrong, Mike? And he's tearful, saying, she keeps asking me, where do we live? Where do we live? And I used the false address. She said, well, then why do you walk three blocks to catch a bus to go home? 
And I was like, wow, she's following us. And I said, we're going to my grandmother's house. My mom had to come up and say, if you have any questions about things like that, ask me, not them. So it was hard being a handful of blacks in an all-white school. And that was in 1975. I know some of you feel like that was a long time ago. For me, it feels like yesterday. Slavery ended. Jim Crow ended. But racism didn't. Just its form of practice has changed. Now it's mass incarceration. The church, and during the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. King wrote a letter from the Birmingham jail saying to white clergy, I want to answer the complaints you're bringing about our nonviolent direct action as being, quote, unwise and untimely. And I don't have time to list it, but you should read his book called Why We Can't Wait. It's really good. The beautiful thing is that in 1963, there was a march on Washington with black and white and all ethnic peoples together. And he said, we were an army, though we didn't have guns. We were not unarmed. Our greatest weapon was love. It's amazing. And here we are again, standing at the gate. And the question is, how will we as a church respond? Peter had to do something. Cornelius had to do something. Peter had to find it within himself to love God and to love his enemies because God loves your enemies. God loves ethnic people who don't look like you or me. And for anybody who's African-American in this room or watching, some things are hard to hear, but they're good to hear because of what they produce later on. As an African-American, you got to forgive hard, hard, especially where there doesn't seem to be repentance. But the beauty is, God sent Cornelius' servants there. I want to ask you here, who's God sent you to? Have you shown up at the gate to say, I'm looking for you? Donnell, I'm looking for you. God has sent me to find you. I pray God show you who he's sending you to. We're standing at the gate. I'll finish with this. I was telling about my wife and how um, there are things that she has said over the years that have been really hard for me to hear. I've been pretty stubborn at times. Probably couldn't acknowledge that in the first year of marriage. You get softer, hopefully, as you get older. But we were having one of those conversations. Any married couples know that conversation. That's a recurring conversation. It keeps coming up, up, and it never gets resolved. It just kind of goes throughout the marriage. Am I alone? Raise your hand if you know. Yeah. We're having one of those moments. And at the end of it, I said, babe, you're right. In fact, what I said, you're right, priest. Uh, Count of Monte Cristo, one of our favorite movies, there's a moment where the guy goes, you were right, priest. You were right. Watch the movie to get the meaning. And I said, you're right, priest. And she said, I'm right? She said, wait, wait, wait. This is not the first time we had this conversation, man. I said, I know. We've had it before. No, no. We've had this conversation many times. I know. You're right. Was I wrong before? Because you never said I was right before. In fact, you said I was wrong. And I said, this time you're right. And you were right all the other times. She said, I'm confused. Help me. Same seed, different soil. Same seed, Marianne different soil. God did some work in my heart, some uncomfortable things that begin to boil up, that soften my heart, so that the same truth that you've been speaking by the Spirit to me over these years, before it fell on hard ground, hard soil, but now the soil of my heart is softened so I can receive it. It's always been hard to hear, but today it's good to hear, and what's been barren in my life will now produce something that's never been seen because I can receive truth that's always been told. I want to say that this church and the church in America is standing at the gate and God is saying to us, the church in America, what he's always said. It's the same scene, but I pray it's different soil. Different soil because of George Floyd. Different soil because of Trayvon Martin. Different soil because of what is brewing up in our nation. That our soil would be softened and we wouldn't shrink back in pain and just lament over the pain of the past, but go, we need to not ignore the pain of the past, but say, God, cause it to have great possibility for the present and where we go from here. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this great church, and I pray that you would show them who you are sending them to. The, the Simon Peters, the, the Donnells, the Leroy's, the Marks, the Marion, whoever they are, that their heart would be responsive to say, that's hard to hear, God, but it's good to hear. Let it go deep enough to produce 
a multi-ethnic people actually living together in unity by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I think about the power of the gospel, I most immediately think about when I first encountered it and how radically it touched me, changed me. And I found it's become easier the older I get to either underappreciate or not recognize at all, to just accept things the way that they are. People will be the way people will be. But as a pastor, as a leader, there's something that burns within me to want to trust the power of the gospel, that it can change lives, cultures, churches, communities, individuals. It can heal physically, emotionally, mentally. It is the power of God unto salvation, the good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I want as a community not to be just run the same way that the world does and make this a left versus right issue or make this a Republican versus Democrat issue or even make this a black versus white issue, but to make this a Jesus issue. That he died on the cross, that a multitude of his family would represent the full spectrum of all that he created and loved. And that we would go out of our way to be a community that doesn't value diversity for diversity's sake, but for Jesus' sake. And that we either humble ourselves and learn to love the way Jesus loves, to stand at the gate like Simon Peter, or to be on the other side of the gate like Cornelius. And we might actually be a meeting place to be a signpost to the world of the good news that in Christ we're not only reconciled to God, but it's actually possible to be reconciled to one another as well. And deeper levels than we are at present. And so we're going to continue to press into that and trust God to lead us into that and to stay faithful to the scriptures throughout all of it because this is what God is really good at. So with all that being said, let's stand to our feet here uh, as we close out. And uh, we've got a prayer that we're going to say together that we've been saying for the past few weeks and we're allowing it to sink deeply into our hearts as a community. So if you want to read this prayer together on the screen and believe in faith along with me. Ready? Father, For you, we will be completely humble and gentle. We will be patient, bearing with one another in love. We will make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Amen. Grace and peace to you all. Livestream, thank you much for tuning in. It's great to see you all.